Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. At the very core of John Chrysostom's homily 16 on the Gospel of Matthew is this discussion of anger and specifically the three precepts that Christ is giving one right after the other and trying to explain what's actually going on in these. Now, these are supposed to be sort of an amplification of the law, uh, a way of uh, adding to it, of explaining it, of, you could say, even consolidating it. And the three precepts run like this. He who is angry with his brother without cause will be subject to the judgment. We'll talk about that without cause in just a moment. The second one, whoever says raka to his brother shall be in danger of the council. And then the third one, Whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And there's no actual explanation of these given in the Sermon on the Mount. And these have been troubling, you could say, or provoking the thought of Christians, really, since the Gospels were you know, circulated around. And Chrysostom is explaining it himself. Now, the first one, I mentioned that we'd come back to this without cause. So there are different variations on the manuscripts. And some of the manuscripts of the Sermon on the Mount contained the word eke, and some of them did not contain that. And then there's a lot of discussion among Christian authors, whether we should pay attention to this or not. So, for example, um, John Cassian says, I don't care if there's an AK without cause in there. Don't get angry. Augustine, uh, on the contrary, and John Chrysostom will say, well, no, this, this kind of matters. You know, some of the texts do say without cause. Let's think about what that could mean. So let's look at what he has to say about the first of these precepts or commands he who is angry with his brother without cause will be subject to the judgment. So what does that actually mean? So Chrysostom is going to say um, he has not altogether taken the thing, anger, away. First, because it's not possible, being a human being, not to get angry at all, to be freed of all the passions. He says we can get you know control over them. But to be altogether without them is out of the question. That's just, I mean, maybe there's somebody down the line who's like that, but that's not us, right? So we need to think about, well, when are we angry with and without cause? And this leads us to thinking about, well, what is anger for? What is the purpose of it? So he says this passion is useful if we know how to use it at the right or appropriate time. And he says, look at, you know, Paul being angry at the Corinthians and how it delivered them from a grievous pest. Um, so by the same means, again, he recovered the people of the Galatians who'd fallen aside. So then, you know, when is the proper time for anger? When should we get angry? And here Chrysostom is going to transform it a little bit. He's actually not going to talk about time so much as reason or motivation. What is the purpose of the anger that we feel? So he says, when we're not avenging ourselves or getting retribution for ourselves, but checking others in their lawless transgressions or forcing them to attend in their negligence. So when people are doing the wrong thing and not, not worrying about whether it's affecting us or not, whether it's affecting others. 
whether it's affecting those very people who are doing wrong. So anger could be suitable for restraining other people, for calling their attention to what they're not paying attention to, for um, protecting others. And so he says, well, what is the unsuitable time? When we're avenging ourselves. So we shouldn't be doing that or when we're contending for riches as well, right? And he says, um, you know, a lot of us uh, don't pay attention to that. We do the contrary. We become like wild beasts when they're injured, but remiss and cowardly when we see things being done to other people. And then it's very interesting what he says here, both of which are opposite to the laws of the gospel. So it could be good for us to be angry within certain limits when we are protecting others, when we're addressing injustices, when we're doing the right thing with it, you could say. So much for that one. What about the second one? This is a little bit mysterious because what the hell is Raka, right? Whoever says Raka to his brother shall be in danger of the council. And he could be like, well, I don't, I don't say Raka very often. So um, I'm not going to have any problems with that, right? I don't even say it with homonyms like rock and roll you know, or something like that. Uh, well, what is Raka? It's, it's a word, uh, and he says this is a word of, of the Syrians. So this is Aramaic, right? And Jesus is using a term that would be familiar to his audience. And he's saying, don't say this to somebody else. It's sort of like when Southerners have that expression, oh, bless your heart, right? It's sort of like saying, oh, you, you know, you, you, you silly person. Um, and so he tells us that it's not an expression of great insolence or insult, right? It's kind of a small thing, but it does express some contempt, some looking down on the other person and slighting, making less of them. So it's not a good thing to do. Uh, he says, we giving orders either to our servants or to an inferior person say, away with you, you here tell such a one. Um, and, and so, you know, he tells us that God doesn't want human beings to be doing this, certainly motivated by anger. He says, God, the lover of human beings, roots up even the least faults, commanding us to behave to one another in a seemly manner and with due respect, and this with a view of destroying thereby also the greater. So this, this is letting anger lead us to showing disrespect to other people, which very often happens, right, when we get angry. Then we have another thing. Whoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. And about this, um, Chrysostom actually tells us the most. He says to a lot of people, this appears too harsh, right? Um, why should we go to hell or be in danger of the hellfire for saying this person's a fool, especially if they are a fool, right? For just calling, as we say, a spade a spade. And so a lot of people think that this is hyperbolic. What does hyperbolic mean? Sort of like over the top, you know? You're not really going to be threatened with hellfire. It's just a figure of speech. God doesn't really mean it. Jesus doesn't really mean it when he's saying this in the Sermon on the Mount. It's just to like scare us so we're not saying fool, fool, fool to people all the time. And Chrysostom says, you know, I'm kind of worried uh, lest when we have deceived ourselves with words here, we may indeed there suffer that extreme punishment. We should not try to pretend this is hyperbolic. And then he says, why do people think that this commandment is overburdensome? You know, why, why is it too much? And then he says, listen, here are some considerations that you should take into mind. He says, words are the beginnings for many sins. And really, they're the medium of many sinful comportments as well. So he gives examples of this. Um, he says, by words are blasphemies. So blasphemies is when you say something against, you know, uh, God or the divine, you're, you're being kind of fast and loose with that. Denials are by words, revilings and reproaches. So when you're like complaining about somebody and you say, oh, they're terrible, right? That is uh, done with words. 
Uh, perjuries, bearing false witness. You're not supposed to lie, right? Bearing false witness doesn't just mean in a court of law. Uh, you're, so, you're not supposed to be lying about other things. And so he says, well, so this is, don't look at this as a mere word, but whether it, it has, you know, danger, this is what you need to think about. And then he says, are you ignorant that in the season of enmity or hatred, when wrath is inflamed and the soul kindled, even the least thing appears great and what is not very reproachable is counted intolerable. Often these little things have given birth even to murder and overthrown whole cities. Just as where friendship is, even grievous things are light. So where enmity lies beneath, very trifles appear intolerable. So when people are ready to get angry, calling them a fool can really bring that anger out. And, you know, whether you're doing it motivated by your own anger or just to mess with them, you know, as we say, to own somebody, it's, it's bad. And it's, uh, you know, you're liable to the ultimate punishment in that case. He, he goes on and he says, um, however simply a word be spoken, it is surmised to have been spoken with an evil meaning. I mean, if you, with most people, if you call them a fool, you're saying something that's meant to hurt, right? It's meant to push buttons. It's meant to get them riled up. And he gives you all sorts of, you know, interesting metaphors here. Basically, I'll, I'll just give you one of them. Uh, with fire, if there's just a small spark, though thousands of planks lie by, it doesn't easily lay hold of them. But if the flame is waxed strong and high, it readily seizes not planks only, but stones and all materials that fall in its way, right? And so, um, you know, you, you shouldn't be calling somebody fool. And he says, therefore, for him who calls fool, uh, Christ has added the fire of hell. Now for the first time mentioning the name of hell in, in the uh, account, right? So, you know, we've got three different things here. Um, Chrysostom goes on and he says, Look at how these are arranged with each other. You know, they're coming one right after the other. This is actually sort of like a gradual process of saying, hey, don't do this. Oh, you did that? Well, don't do this at least. Oh, you went that far? Don't do this. He talks about uh, Christ proceeding by little and little in his punishments, all but excusing himself onto you and signifying that his desire indeed is to threaten nothing of the kind, but we human beings, because we're screw ups, <laughs> we go on and we lead him to the point where he has to threaten us with, with hellfire, right? So he says, for observe, I told you, don't be angry for nothing because you're in danger of the judgment. Okay, well, you did that. Uh, you've despised the former commandment. See what anger has produced. It's led you straightway to insult. You've called your brother Raka. And so that's not good. Again, I set another punishment, the council. And then you overlook even that and proceed to what is even more grievous. I will visit thee no longer with these finite punishments, but with the undying penalty of hell, lest after this you would break forth even to murder and he goes on Chrysostom and he says, there's nothing in the world more intolerable than insolence. It has what uh, very great power to sting a person's soul. But the, when the word too, which is spoken in itself more wounding than the insolence, the blaze becomes twice as great. And he says, you know, you might look at the word fool as not a big deal, but what are you actually saying when you call somebody a fool? You're saying that they're not really human because you know, what is, what is really essential to us as human beings is our intelligence. He says, mind and the understanding. When of this you've robbed your brother, you've deprived your brother of all goodness, nobility, you know, what it is that makes us uh, human. And he says, so, you know, let's think about the, the words themselves. Consider how great a wound is made by this word and onto how much evil it proceeds. What is it that um, these, these threats or these commandments are supposed to do? Well, Chrysostom tells us that it's to remove the roots and the sources of hatred. And why that? 
because what the gospel is about is love. We're supposed to love each other. And, you know, love, people who love each other will get angry with each other, but we want to try to avoid that as much as possible. And then when we are angry, let's not make the other person suffer by calling them all sorts of bad things, let alone going on to actually injure them. So he, he goes on and he says, um, Christ makes much account of love, this being above all things, the mother of every good and the badge of his disciples and the bond which holds together our whole condition. So with reason, he's removing with great earnestness the roots and sources of that hatred. And he goes on and he says, don't think that these sayings are hyperbolical. Consider the good done by them and admire the, and this is interesting, the mildness of these laws. The mildness means the opposite of anger. These laws are not being given in anger. These laws are being given precisely to curb anger among us human beings who are, you know, liable to give in to and feel that that passion so that we don't do stupid things and hateful things as a result of that anger and make things Worse, So he says, there's nothing which God takes so much pains as this, that we should be united and knit together with one another. So therefore, in his own person and by his disciples, as well as those in the Old and New Testament, he makes so much account of this commandment and is a severe avenger and punisher of those who despise the duty. In truth, nothing so effectually gives entrance and root to wickedness as the taking away of love. So love is supposed to be there. These modes of anger, these things that we do out of anger, get in the way of that and uh, substitute hatred, or at least the passion of anger in place of love. And so that's why there's this sort of escalation of rules, of precepts, of advice, given by, uh, according to, to Chrysostom, God himself in, in, in the figure of Christ to us human beings in the teachings uh, in the Sermon on the Mount.